Well, good morning and welcome to Yakima Covenant Church. This is Thomas here, and I'm so thankful that you can join us here for our summer preaching series. Uh, This summer, we're going to be focusing on two main themes. The first one is unleashing the waters of life, and the second one is taste and see. And I'm excited because we have a number of wonderful preachers who are going to be sharing messages throughout this summer. Some of them may be new to you, some of them you've seen before, and some of them are people from our own congregation. So this is a wonderful and exciting time to see different experiences from people and how God is working in their lives and what God wants them to share as they come each week here at Yakima Covenant Church. Um, This theme of water is is such an important biblical theme, so we are dedicating this whole summer to that and the taste and see um, so that we can have a wonderful experience getting deeper into God's Word. We're thankful that you can join us here and be a part of it. Please let us know you're here. You can message us or you can leave a comment or just contact the office or something. But we're just, we're really glad you're here and we are excited with what God is going to do this summer. With that, I'm going to go to our announcements right now. Enjoy our service and have a wonderful day. God bless. Good morning and welcome to Yakima Covenant Church. My name is Warren Lee and we're very thankful that you can join us today. Our guest speaker is going to be the Reverend Jack Flashback, who has preached here before. And uh, he and his wife, uh, Joy, have retired in 2012 and returned to Yakima to be close to their three children's families. Consistent with our theme this month of flowing rivers of water. Uh, Jack enjoyed flowing or floating down rivers, including the uh, scenic current river in the Missouri Ozarks and the Yakima River. And uh, he's preached in St. Louis, Missouri, in Oregon and here in Yakima. And we're very pleased that he's back. We're glad that you could join us this morning and we hope that you'll continue to Uh, worship with us together. May our homes be filled with dancing May our streets be filled with joy May injustice bow to Jesus As people turn and pray From the mountains to the valley our praises rise to you from the heavens to the nations you are singing fill the air may our light shine in the darkness As we walk before the cross 
May your glory fill the whole earth As the water over the sea From the mountains to the valley Hear our praises rise to you from the heavens to the nations, you are singing, fill the
lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes to the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes to the giver of life. You alone can rescue, you alone can save, you alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, let us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise. To you alone belongs the highest praise, Lord. To you alone belongs the highest praise. Besides the creation of the world, as recorded in the book of Genesis, what would you say is the biggest, the most important story of the Old Testament? The answer is the Exodus from Egypt, as recorded in the book of Exodus. The Exodus is the iconic story of deliverance in the Old Testament. Here God rescues the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. God sends 10 plagues upon the Egyptians. But Pharaoh doesn't budge until the last plague, the killing of the firstborn. Then Pharaoh agrees to let God's people go, as God had demanded through Moses. But shortly after the Hebrew slaves leave Egypt, Pharaoh changes his mind and sends the Egyptian army after them. The slaves become caught between the Sea of Reeds and the onrushing Egyptian army. The slaves complain to Moses, Exodus 14, 11, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? As you know, God ordered Moses to stretch his hand over the water and then God separated the water and caused the wind to dry the land. Moses and the children of Israel then walked safely between the wall, these walls of water. When Moses stretched out his hand again over the sea, verse 28, the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. Sometime today, read the whole powerful story of Exodus 14. The Exodus is the iconic event that defines the Israelite people. The prophets refer to it over and over. Now, why did I start out talking about the Exodus? It's because you cannot understand our text today until you understand the importance of the Exodus in the minds of the Israelites. So let's start reading our text, Isaiah 43, 16 and 17. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior, they lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Okay, what's he talking about? The Exodus, of course. Remember the Exodus. But then he says in our text, verse 18, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Wait a minute. Do you want us to remember the Exodus? Or do you want us to not remember it? Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Remember not here does not mean completely forget about. Rather, it means don't get stuck in past glories, as if that's all I'm going to do, because God is saying, I am doing a new thing that surpasses even the Exodus. The very next verse, verse 19, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Right here in the Yakima Valley, we have a prime example of what happens when you bring water into the desert. Look, look up at the hills around Yakima. You can tell exactly what's being irrigated and where the irrigation ends. The difference is dramatic. Every day we live with the big difference water makes here in our valley, and every day it is amazing. When you drive up I-82 to Ellensburg and you see the sage-covered hills, 
You see what Yakima looked like before irrigation water brought flourishing and abundant crops of all kinds in the valley. But what is Isaiah talking about? Isaiah was speaking to the Israelites who were in exile in Babylon back in the middle of the 6th century BC. And the new thing God is promising to do is to bring them out of exile back to the land of Judah. God is going to prepare a highway through the desert and there will be water in the desert to make the trip back to the promised land easy. In other words, Israel is not at a dead end. They are still God's chosen people. And God is going to do a new thing that is far more glorious than even the first Exodus. Isaiah's language here is expansive. It has a fulfillment in the near future, the return from exile, but it also has a glorious fulfillment that is far in the future. The near fulfillment, return from exile, hundreds of years before Christ, was a big deal. But what God does is put a larger promise, a deeper hope into these words that will only be fulfilled in the New Testament and will specifically be fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God that He will bring. Remember the transfiguration of Jesus? Here's what Dr. Luke says, chapter 9, 26 to 31. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure. Moses and Elijah in glory spoke with the transfigured Jesus about his departure. That word departure is the Greek word for exodus. In other words, the crucifixion of Jesus is the new exodus, the new thing that God is doing that surpasses even the Old Testament exodus. At the transfiguration of Jesus, Moses and Elijah represented the law and the prophets of the Old Testament. In other words, they represented the entire Old Testament era. But Moses disappeared and Elijah disappeared and Christ only was left. What does that mean? It means that the law and the prophets are fulfilled in Christ. The entire Old Testament history in Revelation all culminates and it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Ultimately, Christ is the only one who can convey to us the riches and the glory and the love of God. God revealed himself progressively to the people of Israel in the Old Testament. But God reserved his greatest revelation until Jesus Christ, his own son, came in human flesh. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Let me cut to the chase. It is only through Jesus Christ that we understand the meaning and message of the Bible. All the books of the Bible, all the promises of the Bible, all the covenants of the Bible, All the prophecies of the Bible, the entire Bible narrative, both Old and New Testaments, can only be understood in the full light of truth revealed in Jesus Christ. The New Testament authors understood Jesus to be the culmination of the Old Testament. He is the last Adam, the true Israel, the suffering servant, the son of David, the faithful remnant, the ultimate prophet, the reigning king, the final priest. He is himself the temple. He is Moses. He is the embodiment of the whole line of prophets in himself. He is the high priest and he is the sacrificial lamb. Jesus Christ is Israel reduced to one person. Jesus does all that God had wanted Israel to do and more. Jesus welcomes the outcast, heals the sick, comforts the brokenhearted, preaches the kingdom of God, 
suffered and died on the cross and rose again from the dead. One person is the savior of the entire world. I want to return to the Water Series theme passage that Pastor Dean Nelson selected for us. John 7, 37 to 39. On the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This he said about the Spirit. Now, the amazing nature of water is a living symbol of the amazing work of the Holy Spirit in us. So let's talk about water and then compare it to the Holy Spirit. Some 70% of the earth's surface is covered by water. By coincidence or divine design, the human body is made up of about 70% water. We humans are creatures of water. It is absolutely essential for life. We can live no more than 40 days without food, but no more than seven days without water. In our bodies, water transports nutrients, gets rid of wastes, acts as an air conditioner and universal solvent, and helps other chemicals react with one another. Water is an element in the lubricating fluid of the eye and around the joints. An average adult uses up to three quarts of a day internally, and it is important that these quarts be replaced. Nutrition and health experts tell us that most Americans don't drink enough water. Water is abundant on earth, but water does not behave like other substances. Its very strangeness makes human life possible. So let's talk about that. The water molecule is small with a molecular weight of 18. Compare that to one of the smallest proteins, insulin, which has a molecular weight of 5,733. A single drop of water weighing 0.1 grams contains about 3 billion trillion water molecules. That's three with 21 zeros after it. The water molecule consists of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen, giving us the familiar formula H2O. The arrangement of the three atoms is such that the molecule is mildly polarized having both a positive and a negative pole. This mild polarity, along with the tiny size of the water molecule, together give rise to the unusual qualities of water, which make life on Earth possible. Water is the only substance found in three states on Earth's surface, as solid ice, as liquid water, and as water vapor. This variety results from water's high specific heat capacity, the amount of energy needed to raise its temperature. That's why it takes so long to get water boiling. This property allows water to remain in a liquid state simultaneously around the world, despite vastly different temperatures in the Arctic and the tropics. It also means that Living things can maintain fairly constant body temperature amid fluctuating ambient temperatures. As well, contrary to most substances, water does not shrink when it freezes. It, it actually expands, which means that ice floats. If water acted like other substances and contracted when it froze, the oceans and lakes would freeze from the bottom up and little life would survive. Instead, the frozen layer on top insulates the body of water below, allowing life to thrive under the ice. Another amazing property of water allows aquatic life underwater to thrive, and that is the ability of water to absorb oxygen increases as the temperature decreases, which is why fish are usually much more abundant in cold water than in warm tropical waters. The, water's the water molecule's polarity gives rise to a mild cohesiveness which supports capillary action where water is drawn up from the soil into the trees and plants. There's more amazing stuff about water, but this is enough to help us realize that everyday water is really 
a miracle substance whose unusual features are essential for life on earth as we know it. Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This he said about the Spirit. Why did God choose water to be one of the major symbols for the Holy Spirit, along with wind and fire? Well, water seems common and ordinary, and yet its remarkable properties bring amazing benefits. In the same way, God's Spirit pouring out of us seems ordinary and yet carries enormous blessings. You know, sometimes I think the church work should be one, of, uh, one obvious miracle after another. You know, just like the ministry of Jesus. Shouldn't we just amaze people into the kingdom of God? Well, God can and does perform miracles sometimes. But the main way his work is done is not flashy or showy. God is not in the entertainment business. He's in the changed lives business. And a lot of Jesus' ministry was his preaching and teaching and the changes that came into people's lives as a result. A lot of the Spirit's work is done as we go about the daily and seemingly ordinary activities of prayer and worship and Bible study and song. A lot of the Spirit's activity is done quietly, without fanfare, in small acts of love and service, a quiet conversation, a phone call, a prayer, a visit to a neighbor, a visit to the sick or shut-in, attentive listening, words of encouragement, Spiritual transformation is not only big, obvious stuff. Spiritual transformation is not only big, obvious stuff. It's also the hidden stuff in our hearts and souls. It's the quiet releasing of a heart from spiritual bondage. The changing of a person's mind as God re-educates that mind through the Holy Scriptures. The quiet coming of a soul to faith. It's you and me sharing the love of Jesus in unassuming ways showing God's mercy to real people with real needs, rivers of living water. To bring this sermon home, I invite you sometime today to read the Exodus account in Exodus 14 and then read Ephesians 3 to bring home the supreme importance of Christ. And while you're reading those chapters, put yourself in a place where you can hear water, where you can see water, where you can feel water, you know, read the Bible while you're taking a bath or something like that. May the Spirit of God, like water, be unleashed within us and bring blessing to the earth. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Friends and neighbors, Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, our Lord, please join me in our prayer of the people. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy and our salvation and your blessings that have enabled us to overcome the challenges of our lives in the past year. And for now, and for the beautiful spring and summer that you have blessed us with here in the Yakima Valley. We ask your blessings on our congregation and those of our congregation who have passed on during this time and on the newborn and baptized and our new church members and guests. We ask for your healing, blessing, and salvation to our church members who are ill and maybe still struggling to overcome the other challenges in their lives and families. May your Holy Spirit guide us through these times with the light and love of God. We ask for your holy wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that we may seek and know the truth and make the right decisions and take the right actions to glorify your holy name and serve your holy will, both now and forevermore. Help us to be good fishermen and women in the flowing river of our lives and in the life of our church 
to spread the message of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and to do deeds of love and kindness and be good stewards who build upon your blessings to build better lives and a better world. Please join us in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the Father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer but this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom 